Thanks to everybody who's coming. I'm looking forward to this presentation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and let's uh, let's dive into it. All right. So uh, my name is Fred Dixon, co-founder of Big Blue Button and also CEO of Blindside Networks. So let me start off with uh, just two things. I mentioned Big Blue Button and Blindside Networks. Uh, we are an open source project focused on one goal, to build the world's most effective virtual classroom. So we've been thinking about this for a long time, like 14 years now, uh, and done pretty well. The Big Blue Button is now a global project localized in over 55 languages. And for example, the French Ministry of Education uses it as their state webinar system. So it's used heavily around the world. And Blindside Networks, we started the Big Blue Button project in 2007. And so, so far in the last couple of years, we've done over 2 billion minutes of online classes. And Rutgers is part of those minutes as well. Rutgers has been a heavy user of us. So I have three outcomes that I gave uh, for doing this presentation. So one is, uh, what does theory tell us about the structure of synchronous online? How to measure the effectiveness of synchronous online? And what is the future of synchronous online? And I've used the term synchronous online because I know that's what Rutgers talks about virtual classrooms. So synonymous, but in the context of Rutgers, let's use the term from Rutgers. And this is interactive. So please feel type in the chat. Uh, Omar will let me know if there's anything that comes up that I will, and I will answer questions uh, at the end as well. So a couple of observations. We've been working on uh, delivering virtual classes, uh, building Big Blue Button for 14 years, and let's just make an observation. Delivering an effective synchronous online class is not easy. And so the way we approach it is we try to break it down into first principles so that we can create a framework to simplify the effort. How can we make it easier for the instructor to deliver an effective virtual class? And of course it begs the question, what is an effective virtual class? And I will go into that. So let's start with the three outcomes. So what does learning theory tell us about the structure of synchronous online? And Synchronous Online is really an intersection of three disciplines. So uh, what are the use cases for the educator and student? What is learning theory? Uh, how does our brain learn? You know, pedagogy and technology. And in the sweet spot in, in the middle of these, if you use the best of all three, you're going to have what we will argue through this presentation, an effective online class. So I'm gonna break down the three of them and really there's a bunch of details uh, for the educator and student. I'll look at the use cases. Here is just simply how our brains work. Uh, we have short-term, long-term memory. We have automatic thinking, higher order thinking. Uh, our knowledge is built into hierarchies. Obviously we learn on what we've learned. Social constructivism, we learn effectively, more effectively when we learn with others. And also we learn in stages. And the technology of synchronous online affords us some things that we cannot do as easily in the physical class. And I should point out, Synchronous Online is not meant to replace the physical class. Think of it as an augmenting. And as the keynote said, you know, Rutgers has an online uh, offering because it enables anybody in the world to have access to a high quality online education. And when you do it online, you can do fast context switching, parallel activities. You can obviously record the session. It can be deeply integrated with the LMS. You have analytics, and there's also some potential for AI, which I'll talk about near the end. Okay, so how do our brains learn? Well, uh, our brains learn in stages. So uh, I'll pause for a moment. Can, if you know who did this diagram for stages of learning, uh, please type it in the chat. Let's see how many people get it. So uh, our brains just learn in a series of stages. So this pedagogy, of course, is Bloom's taxonomy. You, before you know something, you start with remembering, you go through all the stages and you get to create at the end. And the, basically you master. And the goal of learning is to achieve mastery. And it kind of looks like a staircase. And I'll use that analogy a little bit later. So if you look at Bloom's taxonomy enough, there's kind of three groups of it. And there's this middle part where you do a lot of applying. The first group, you kind of do memory, short-term to long-term memory. I mean, you may understand uh, what the difference is between a Macintosh apple and a Golden Delicious but it is uh, still, you haven't done anything to apply it yet. So once you go up a bit higher, 
going back to brain theory, uh, you're now applying what you're learning. You're trying to you know, make a cake, bake it, pull it out of the oven, measure the temperature, the color, maybe the taste, and evaluate whether the cake turned out to be or the pie turned out to be as well as you wanted. And so you're, you're thinking hard about that. Another example I like to use for like automatic thinking and higher order thinking is if I just asked you what two plus two is, you'd say four automatically. But if I asked you what 329 plus 456 is, you'd have to stop and think about that for a moment. And that's where your brain is kicking in and saying, okay, um, our brains are lazy. They're trying to conserve energy. They'd have to think about it. And if you did that, if you, for example, did uh, three digit numbers, uh, two three digit numbers, adding them in your mind, you get pretty good at it afterwards, after a while. And then the last uh, stage is create. And this is where creativity, uh, mastery of, or to be able to apply something, to be able to master these parts, and then to have the creativity, you can then apply it to other areas. And that is mastery. The goal of learning is to reach mastery. The observation here, though, is if you start from here, you must get through the apply stage. You can't get to mastery unless you apply something. And again, that makes sense, right? Our brains are not computers. We can't watch three hours of Spanish YouTube videos on basic Spanish and go out in the street and start speaking it because we haven't done any applying. Uh, our brain hasn't rewired itself to try to remember how to do things. So we kind of look at this and say, well, this is the, let's call this the apply zone, where when you actually start to close the book and try to apply something, then you figure out whether you've really learned it or not. And we've all had the examples where we learn something, we read about it, we watch the lecture. Oh, that looks obvious. Sure, I can do that. But then again, if you close the book and you can't, well, you still need to learn. You need to learn how to apply it and go through these stages of learning before you get to mastery. So there's this cycle that's going to go on when you do applying. And then again, we thought a lot about this and developing virtual classes. So what's really happening? When you're in the apply zone, uh, you're going to put forward some effort. That's the higher order thinking. And that effort is, this is on behalf of the student. Uh, we want them to basically say the more they apply themselves, the more they learn. But what will happen is when you put forward the effort, you're going to struggle a bit. You know, that's, and struggle is good. Struggle is how our brains learn. Um, when something isn't working, we all know this from our life, if something doesn't work, then you have to really think about why it's not working. And when you figure it out, you learn. Same thing with learning anything. But it also helps us to get feedback. So we don't want to struggle too hard because then it's frustrating. And if the, it was too easy, maybe we're not learning anything. Like if, again, if I ask three plus three, you already know it. Um, but you always want to do things where you apply yourself in an area that's just hard enough to learn or to think, but not too hard that you can't do it. But a little feedback or help along the way, and then you achieve that next level of understanding and you get this cycle going on. As a student in life or lifelong learning, we once we realize that the more we apply ourselves, that the struggle is natural, the more you learn. And that's the cycle, as opposed to passively doing something like watching three hours of basic Spanish or passively attending a virtual class without doing anything. All right. So uh, that's the stages of learning. And there's uh, that's one of the uh, dimensions. The other one was the use cases for teacher and student. And look, I'm just going to put these forward as what we looked at in doing analysis and lots of use cases, talking to teachers who taught online and, and students. What, how could we think about the complexity of teaching online? And so we basically broke the complexity down to four areas, management, relationship, engagement, and assessment. These are all things that occur during the live class. So I'll just put forward the use cases we came up with. And this is really meant to be a concise summary of what educators, teachers, instructors, professors are trying to do and to make it sort of memorable. So when we think about virtual classes, we think about these and keep them in mind. So basically as an educator, you want to set up and manage your classroom for success. Like you want everything ready to go and you want to have minimal amount of effort to deliver the class. Really important is to establish presence and trust with and between the students. And that's important because in a physical class, we're very attuned to making these relationships before, during and after class, the harder and online, right? There's this sense of distance. So you have to kind of overtly bridge that distance and make it possible for students to get comfortable with each other. 
And the reason you want them comfortable is they're going to need to apply themselves. And when they apply themselves, they're going to make mistakes. And mistakes are okay. That's part of learning. The third sort of use case for engagement is as the educator, you want to effectively engage and activate their minds. That's getting them into the higher order thinking. That's getting them into the apply zone. And the fourth is you want to be able to assess their progress and give timely feedback. And there's some things that you can do online uh, with analytics that make that much easier to do than maybe a class of 50 students or 100 students where there's this back of the classroom going on. For students, it's simpler. You want to feel comfortable to participate. So you, the relationship is established. You don't mind making mistakes. Your goal is to efficiently master new skills. That's climb, bloom, staircase. And for assessment, you want to receive help when struggling. So in seven use cases, this comprises what we think the goals are of the educator and the student. Now, if you stare at this long enough, you'll notice that there's some patterns here and that basically these first two are really setting it up for this to do the engagement, the applied learning. And this assessment is really setting it up for you to be able to give feedback to students and for the students to receive help, receive help when struggling. So what does this tell us about the structure or the goal of an effective class? Well, for the learning theory and the use cases, we would argue with this, that it says the most effective synchronous online class is one that maximizes time, that's those first two, so that you can spend the most amount of time getting students to apply themselves and give them feedback, either you to the students or from the students to each other, so they can climb the loom staircase and learn. So you need to be able to apply yourself to get that brain high order, and you need the feedback on those times when you're struggling so that you can just get enough information to reach that level of understanding. So this is how we came to our first principles to thinking about how could we measure or judge the effectiveness of an online class. It's complex, but the core of it is this, not passive learning, applied learning, and giving students feedback when they struggle. That reinforces to students the value of coming to the class. Okay, so the question really was, how do you structure a class? Well, the instructor should just talk for 60 minutes and the students shouldn't do anything. No, that's not an effective class. Uh, when you think about the use cases, you kind of get four uh, sort of categories. You would do uh, sort of four blocks or four beats of a virtual class. And I would suspect many of you, if you taught online, you kind of do this intuitively. So this is, there's no rocket science here. It's really just sort of stating the obvious, but in a way that makes it a bit more easy to sort of structure and maximize time for applied learning and feedback. So we would argue that the first part relationships is where you spend a bit of time at the beginning of the class getting students to do something. Like that might have them all doing multi-user whiteboard or chatting or getting, giving them an activity that like, you know, what did you do over the weekend? Or what was the favorite movie? Or, you know, how do you like to cut your toast? Vertical or slight diagonal, just icebreakers. You want them warmed up. You want them comfortable sort of interacting with each other. And then you would do a bit of preview uh, of the uh, review of the last class. And that's to make sure that the foundation of the knowledge you're building upon are solid, right? Our brain uh, organizes knowledge into hierarchies. You would uh, preview what's coming. There would be a main segment. You would review. Ideally, you get the students to tell you what happened, what they thought was the main points. Uh, again, sort of the recall would, would uh, kick their brains into higher, higher order thinking. And then the summary and next steps. And I've even known uh, instructors to like let use the last 10 minutes of the class where they get students working on the assignment. So the students are kind of like off to the races. And if there's anyone having troubles, the teacher will instruct them or help them out for those last 10 minutes. This main segment is kind of like showtime. And this is where, uh, again, you're probably doing this. You break the topic down into small sort of segments. Eight to 12 minutes is about as long as our brain will go before we lose and then you have lots of time for engagement and assessment. So lots of time for applied learning and assessment. And you use that assessment to determine, is the information sinking in? And if so, you're good to go to the next. And if not, maybe you take a few more moments to show it up. To show it up. The live online class or the synchronous online can have lots of data that you can use. So let's just go back for a moment to that applied learning cycle. And I'm gonna bring it back into some of the things that we're doing in the Big Blue Button Project and how we apply this. So yes, this is the cycle that you want. And if you look at this a bit differently, there's two parts where the platform can help out. 
obviously apply. You want to have lots of built-in tools to do applied learning. You don't want to have students go to third-party tools. Ideally, the platform should understand what you're trying to do, teach and learn. And uh, the platform should understand that the goal of the class is not to meet, but to learn. So how can it help you learn? Well, lots of built-in applied learning activities. And then as the students apply effort in those activities, that activity generates analytics. And then you can give students feedback by looking at which students are struggling. And I've got a couple screenshots of that. Another activity, this is another example we like to say called hidden mouse pointers uh, or visual assessment. So we realized that a lot of teachers were using multi-user whiteboard and having students point at things. And then we realized, well, what if we turned it so that the students couldn't see each other pointers? Then it becomes really powerful for the educator to say, okay, just point to me where Spain is. And you can visually see which students are struggling because they can't see each other. And that can apply to many different areas. This is examples of how do we maximize time for applied learning and feedback? How do we give the instructor visibility into what students are, who are struggling and opportunities to give feedback? Polling is another example. We do it here. So there's like example what the rings of Saturn are made of and you get four or five choices. I'll do a live demo of this in a moment with some of our, some of the other members of the team. And I have got some screenshots here on the uh, learning analytics dashboard. And again, I'll do a live of this, but this gives you an example where during a session, we realized it was really powerful if the instructor could have a dashboard that's updated every 15 seconds, showing them who's in the class, how long each person talked, shared their webcam, messaged emojis, raised their hand, and from that gave an activity score. And what we could do in that activity score is we could actually quickly determine which students were struggling. So maybe this one hasn't done anything, or if you sort it, you could see which ones are the most active. And again, if learning, applied learning, takes effort, and effort is a proxy for learning, or activity is a proxy, then you could see which students were active or not. Here we can show uh, who raised hands. You don't have to remember if there was a particular slide where students raised their hands. And here you can show all the poll results. So it's very easy to see who was responding to polls. And here we just bold the, the most common answer and who was maybe not getting the right answers. So again, letting you pinpoint students that are struggling. The model we have in the virtual classroom should be that there should be no back of the virtual classroom. All students should be visible through the analytics or let's put it a different way. All this data is coming to the instructor during the live class. You just can't remember it all. So we're just gonna consolidate the data so it helps you see the patterns in the class. Maybe those patterns will highlight students or groups of students that are still struggling and give them a moment, give them feedback in the moment. Okay, so the second outcome was how to measure the effectiveness of synchronous online. Well, Having gone through some analysis and done some first principles and figured out, well, like what, how do you, what is an effective virtual class? This one becomes a bit easier. So I wanna just make a point about again, how our brain learns and how the virtual class kind of builds upon each other's. If you think of Bloom's taxonomy and I just shaded here showing, let's say you've mastered the stages, it's just climbing Bloom staircase. And after every class, uh, you would expect to start off with maybe I don't know very much. And over time, I start to understand and remember. And then over time, I'm able to apply, assess, and evaluate. And then at some point, I get to a place where I can apply this to other areas. I've mastered the, 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 uh, the concepts. This happens over time. And you can think of every time as sort of like a, a workout of the brain. And uh, the learning workouts, as I said, as I said earlier, the goal is for them to just be hard enough to get students to think hard, but not too hard they can't do it. And you want to keep them in the apply zone. Um, this was using uh, Midjourney to try to give me a dumbbell that has books as the weights. No, it didn't do such a bad job. But the idea is you're kind of lifting knowledge. You want to exercise your brain instead of lifting weights for your muscles. So let's go back to this statement. And this is sort of like at the heart of where we think uh, about virtual classes, maximize time for applied learning and feedback. So how would you measure this? Well, you would first measure it in terms of time saved, simplifying the management of the class. Like think of it, you don't have to use third-party tools. The platform is actively assisting you to teach because it knows the purpose of the class is not to meet, it's to learn. Uh, you have analytics that help you to suss out which students may be struggling. Like, all these things should be there uh, as your co-pilot 
in the, in the class. So saving you time. And that time would be maximize the time where you can get students to apply themselves. So you would teach the content and as much as possible, get them to be thinking and applying themselves. And again, the platform should help you do that. And then feedback. You can also measure like how much feedback we're able to give to students or maybe how much feedback the students got from each other in breakout rooms. Uh, an example might be is if you could construct the breakout rooms and you knew which students were strong and weak, you would of course match up the strong students with the weaker students so that they would get more opportunities for feedback from the stronger students. And of course the stronger students would get more opportunities to think and apply themselves. It, you, there's that phrase, you know, I hear, I remember, I see, I forget, I do, I understand. I may understand something, but if I have to explain it to someone else, that's even going to reinforce my understanding of it. I'm going to shift back to Big Blue Button, because again, when you think about maximized time for applied learning and feedback, some things start to pop out at you. One is that the slides contain content, and the slides also contain information that you would like to do formative assessment. So here, the example would be the slides actually contain some text where I could ask the students, do you agree? Did Einstein discover the atom? True, false. So I'm going to do a demo of this. Uh, there's three things, simplify the management of the class, keep students in the apply zone and give feedback. And you might've realized that I've been using like a mouse and I've been annotating if I'm going through it. Uh, well, this is because I'm using Big Blue Button. So uh, I actually have uh, some of the team members here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch over to uh, a slide deck, which actually is going to show some of these concepts about maximizing time for applied learning and feedback. So here I have some slides. I love this demo. So here I just put some text in. I did this with PowerPoint and I just wrote the text, did Einstein, did Einstein discover the atom? True, false. Well, uh, there's some text here, yes, no. And what Big Blue Button does is it reads this text into memory for screen readers and uh, allows me to do annotations and everything on it. But because it's read it into memory, I actually know that, hey, I see this text, yes, no. So let's do a yes, no poll. And as I do it, I can see the responses live and I can see which students have, uh, you know, got it correctly or not. And when I'm done, I can publish the results. And when I publish it, it goes back into the slide and it goes back into the public chat here as well. But let's just pause for a moment. I didn't actually type in the question. I just simply clicked a button because Big Blue Button detected that there was a poll like question in the slide and saved me time. So let's do another example. So let's say, what are the rings of Saturn made of? Uh, there's four, cho five choices. And I'm just gonna click here. And again, one button click. So imagine you've been doing a class, you've taught for eight to 12 minutes and you've got a couple poll questions set up in your slides. You don't have to type anything. You shouldn't have to type anything. Just click a button and start to see the results come back. I'll go to the next one. So here's one, what two elements comprise table salt? Well, by putting in two question marks, I'm gonna allow students to do uh, multiple responses. So there are two elements, they're listed here and I can see some of the results. Okay, my staff has, or their team has knows a lot about uh, these examples. So I think one of them is actually making it uh, wrong by mistake, thank you. And I'll do one more. So if you have a, a question where you want students to type the answer in, so here you could ask a question, it could be anything and you ask them to put a response in Two cars starting from the same point, 5 a.m., traveling opposite directions, 40 and 50 miles per hour, respectively. What time will they be 450 miles per part? And you can see them entering the answer. Cool. You can also uh, hide the content in the slide. So here's an example where I still have ABCD, and I could do a poll, but I'm actually going to do a formative assessment as well. So I'm gonna ask everybody to just move their mouse around and say, how do you feel about uh, math problems so far? Now, they actually can see each other, but if I turn on the uh, lock viewers and I just, actually it's already on, they can't actually see each other. So nobody can see each other's. So if I was pointing out a map of the world or pointing out a wireframe of a plane, or in this case here, again, it's visual assessment. I see all of it, but they don't. And while I'm doing this, uh, the Learning Analytics dashboard has been keeping track of data. So here I mentioned there's 11 users. I can see how long everyone's online. I can see their activity scores. So I can see if anybody hasn't been doing anything. So I see a few students who haven't been active. I'm gonna ask a few of them to just raise their hand. And in a few seconds, this will update as well. 
And while that's doing it, I'm gonna go check out the polls. So here are the poll results. So again, as an instructor, I don't have to remember this. I could actually use this data through my class to see, are the students learning? And if I go back to timeline and I can see all the slides that I've been doing and I can see which students have been raising their hands as well. So really cool. And I believe if I go here, I can see which students have been raising their hand according to which slide. All right, let's go back to the presentation. So I'm gonna switch back to uh, Rutgers. Okay, I'm gonna lower everyone's hands. Thanks everybody. And let's make this full screen again. Okay. So let's move to the kind of fun part, which is what uh, are our predictions for the future of synchronous online? And again, not surprising, we're gonna base this on a lot of thinking hard about what it makes an effective virtual classroom. So I'll do this in two parts. I'll show you some of the plans we have in our product to again, maximize time for applied learning and feedback. And I'll show you some of the things I think about in the future. And then we can open up for discussions. So there's, uh, you can think of the virtual classroom as having a before, during, and after part. The before part, the before part is actually in the LMS. So that's where students will live, do their assignments, um, collaborate with each other. And the LMS may know information about the students that would be very helpful to the instructor during the live class. It doesn't take rocket science to say if a student hasn't put the last two assignments in, they're probably at risk. So if you have 30 students show up at the class and two of them haven't delivered in the last two assignments, it'd be really nice to know that during the virtual class. You could probably give those students maybe a bit more attention, a bit more encouragement, and catch them so that they don't feel uh, frustrated, that they can learn it. A little bit of feedback and support may turn them into getting back on track and graduating or completing the course. But that's only gonna be helpful to you if you knew the information. Now you could manually search it before each virtual class or synchronous online, but why would you? If the, if the data is there, shouldn't it be shared with the virtual class platform and then vice versa? So here's an example where It'd be really good if the LMS passed on some information and that made it visible to you that you, we were actionable during the class. So two students here, the LMS has given a bit of information. You can click to see what it is. And that link here would take you back to uh, the LMS to go exactly looking more deeper. Two examples of where we think more visibility would be really cool. One we have called breakout vision, where when you put students in the breakout rooms, be really cool to see uh, the activities on the whiteboard for each breakout room and also an activity score where you could see our, how the students are doing. So just like we have an activity score in the main room, talking, chatting, raising your, raising your hand. If there was a breakout room where there was no activity score and you're wondering which one would have the most use of my time, most effective use, probably that one. This is something that we're working on this year and we call it whiteboard vision. So the example is really following from applied learning and feedback. So imagine you have 12 students or 20 students, whatever, you give them three items to work on. Let's say it's three slides and they can go back and forth between the slides. And there's some whiteboard activity as well. You put them into a mode where each of them have their own individual whiteboard, but they can't see each other's. And then you can observe how students are responding to each of the uh, questions, whether they're getting it right or not. And you can observe what's happening in the whiteboard. Big Blue Button can observe this as well. And imagine it orders the, uh, the, the views of each whiteboard in the order of those that are least active and getting the most questions wrong. Then during the class, during this say 10 minute segment that you have them applying themselves, you click on the first student and on the right hand side, it gives you a one-on-one -on -one with the student with shared webcam, shared audio and shared whiteboard. Then you help that student for a moment in struggling and you go on to the next and the next and the next. So in that 10, 12 minutes, you maybe help three or four students who are most in need of help and they then get to that level of understanding. It's really enforces for them that the more they imply themselves, the more they learn. And that's the virtuous cycle that you want, not passive learning. Okay, so let's talk about uh, what I think is probably one of the most important features of synchronous online. And so, What's gonna happen in the virtual class as they evolve? Well, I think uh, artificial intelligence or artificial general, general intelligence is gonna be very helpful, but right now it's not looked upon as such because students can use it to basically get answers without thinking. 
And again, if you go back to how our brain works, um, if you don't think hard about something, our brains don't rewire, the synapses don't rewire between the neurons and you're not really learning. So uh, let me ask a question. If you were struggling, what is the best way to learn outside the class? So whether it's online class or physical class, what's the best way to learn? Okay. I'm gonna actually flip back to here. Look at the chat. Okay, so tell me, what do you think is the best way to learn outside the class? This is where I'm gonna switch you to higher order thinking. Uh, research, investigate the topic, consult someone else, teach someone else. Okay, Priscilla, that's really good. But let's say you're struggling with something you don't really know it, and it's clear you're struggling, and you're just hitting a wall over and over again outside of the class. What's the best way to learn? Do is one, okay. So I'm gonna push you a bit more. Let's say you're struggling, you just, I don't know. I, I, I try to do it and I can't. And I think we've all had this case. I took a degree in mathematics and uh, was very interested in computers. The school I was at uh, only knew, uh, well, the uh, computer science at the time was in the math department. So I had to take a lot of math. Trial and error, Warren. Uh, me with the instructor, okay, closer. Yes, write, it out, write an outline. So what if the instructor wasn't available? Who else could you go to or hire to help you uh, learn? A tutor, Catherine, bang on, bang on. So um, this is where I think uh, there's a huge benefit and it affects, and it actually has a benefit for virtual classes as well. So I think with a tutor, so for anyone who was fortunate enough to have a tutor, I mean, what would happen is the tutor would sit down next to you, watch you struggle a bit and start to figure out where you are. So let's put a few diagrams for this. So usually when you wanna learn something new, um, because our schools, uh, a lot of high schools, they will, grade, they will graduate you based on marks. So let's say you had an 80% in math. Well, that's great, but it also implies that 20% you didn't understand. And if you compound that year over year, at some point you're gonna to get to learn something that is gonna be based on that 20% or the, ten, or the cumulative 20%, it's gonna be really hard. So here's an example where again, knowledge is built into hierarchies. Let's say you wanna learn something new, but you were actually not too strong in these underlying concepts. And what's more is you may not, under, you may not even know you're not very strong in underlying concepts. So if you think about this in Bloom's taxonomy, where we learn in stages, at each one of these underlying concepts, we're somewhere along Bloom's staircase, right? So it's not like we either know or don't know, we're just somewhere along trying to understand and master it. And if you think of what a tutor would do, is a tutor wouldn't, if a tutor was watching you struggle with a math problem, they wouldn't sit down next to you, look at what you're struggling, ask you, you know, here, give me that sheet of paper, work out the problem and give you the answer and just walk out the door. That wouldn't be very strong tutoring. What a tutor would normally do is something like this. I would probably say after watching you struggle for a while, I would say, okay, I know you're frustrated. I'm gonna break this down for you into bite-sized chunks. I'm gonna figure out the best learning path based on how I observe you learn. And for each concept you need to master, I'm gonna help you through the stages of learning, that's climb bloom staircase with minimal effort. So that think of that as the optimal workout. You know, it's not too easy, it's not too hard. You're gonna get that mental workout that's just strong enough, just difficult enough to stretch your understanding so that you can get the next uh, level of understanding uh, and then do it again and again until you fully climb Bloom's staircase. But do it in a way that optimizes it because it knows exactly where you're standing on Bloom's staircase. So the tutor would then say, okay, I guarantee you at the end of this process that you will master the new concept in the most efficient way possible. That's what a really good tutor would do. Now, could a computer do that today for you? No, but what if it could? So uh, thinking a lot about this, so this is, this is my prediction for the future. So you came here wondering what the future of virtual or synchronous online is. Uh, I have lots of ideas about how to make classes more effective for applied learning and feedback. And I've thought a lot about uh, how personal artificial general intelligence tutor, let's call it a pageant for short, 
how a pageant might help. And I believe if, imagine every student in the world had a personal tutor that could determine the knowledge gaps for a particular topic. So AI can do this or AGI can do this because it has absorbed the hierarchy of knowledge. It created a personalized learning pathway based on the areas of where it saw you weak. So we'll think of this as a learning workouts. It gives you feedback when you're struggling. And let's push this out for a moment. Like let's imagine you tilted your webcam down on your page and you're writing out and it could see what you're writing and used uh, handwriting recognition to figure out where your challenges are and actually gave you feedback as you were doing it, right? It could almost be like a tutor. In fact, I think it could, but it would never ever tell you the answer because that robs you from that effort to kind of get to that level of understanding in your brain, that joy of learning. Uh, we have all had experiences where we would have spent, you know, long periods of time struggling to learn something. And when the light comes on, man, that uh, delayed gratification just it reinforces the value of learning of that applied learning cycle. So for a student, this would be pretty cool. Like you imagine that you have a personal tutor, but let's think of it from the point of view of the educator, the instructor. Well, what if everyone was using, uh, had a, a Paget, a personal artificial general intelligence tutor, and the instructor had a dashboard that could be visible into all the students' gaps of knowledge. So the instructor could see where students were on Bloom's staircase through each of the gaps and the instructor could use that information to better tune the class. So you would really have insight into what students were struggling with, like where were the gaps of knowledge? And what if that uh, dashboard, the data from that could help you better tune the activities you might do in the live class? And the live class could maybe focus on some gap that is uh, half the students are struggling with. And you know that if you close that gap, they'll be able to learn the rest of it faster. And I think if we push this a bit further, it actually is gonna change the role of the instructor and even a bit more like a coach. So um, look, we're human. Um, even though anyone can go down to ChatGPT now and start trying to use it to learn or a textbook or a YouTube video, we're still human. I mean, we learn best from each other. And I think that's where the virtual classroom, the synchronous online has a really good opportunity because we have a chance to learn from an instructor who is actually maybe more inspired, more, um, more able to give us motivation. You know, we want you to do well, personalize it, challenge you, and I think also collaborate. So, I mean, when I went to university, I basically did most of it myself. Um, and that was just, you do that in computers. But I believe that there's an opportunity where uh, university could even emphasize more collaboration, teamwork, doing this in group activities, breakout rooms. And so that students not only get to apply themselves to the task, but get to be comfortable applying it in teams to a task. Because let's be honest, uh, the world has a lot of tough problems to solve. And I don't think they can be solved individually. I think they need to be solved by students who are caring, curious, skeptical, thoughtful, and are really, really good in working together to solve the world's problems. So that's my bet in terms of where I think the world is going. Uh, or where the world could go for uh, how AI. And I put a link to it earlier in the chat. Um, I actually wrote an article in Medium about this about a month and a half ago, really trying to think through what artificial general intelligence is doing and how to get past the idea that it can just be used for plagiarism, which is, look, the world we live in. But how, if we look at first principles, how our brain works, how we learn, how could it be used to help everyone in the world uh, be a more effective learner and help both the teacher and the student? And that's where I came down to, well, let's imagine it had a tutor mode and what would that mean if it did? That's my presentation, everybody. I welcome any feedback at the moment and I look forward to, um, to watching the rest of the conference. So I'm gonna take a moment and just read through uh, some of the comments here. Um, Mike wrote, I could see this being incredibly useful for students who are bored. Paget could flag them for an instructor who could offer more challenging work to keep students engaged in the flow. Exactly. So imagine um, you could see a student that was really struggling. And even more so, let's say a student uh, emailed you a question or asked you a question in the virtual class. Uh, and the Paget kind of gave you like uh, a diagnosis of the, where the student was. So at a glance, you could see that there's got some gaps they haven't closed yet. 
it would just give this teacher or the instructor more visibility into where students are struggling. Would Paget take the human out of tutoring? No. I don't think, uh, I don't think we're going to get to a place where AI is going to you know, generate a movie and we're just not going to go see a movie created by humans or something like that. We are humans. We learn best from each other. But not everybody in the world has access to a personal tutor. If they did, for many people in the world, it would be, I think, game changing. Where they, they wouldn't struggle not knowing what they don't know. The personal tutor uh, could help them figure out the gaps in knowledge, help them shore it up, help them learn more effectively and get them better ready to apply their knowledge. Because again, unless you apply, you can't get the mastery. And that's where the educational institutions and the teachers, the instructors could really help. Our your goal here is you're gonna know basic stuff, but we're gonna help you apply it. Cool. You can, you can kind of do a little bit of this today with uh, chat, uh, GPT, but it's not built in, right? It doesn't give you the knowledge hierarchies. It doesn't ask you questions to figure out your gaps. Um, and again, this, I, I will put emphasis, like our, the world we live in, the world I think a lot about is effective virtual classrooms. And uh, if you can use it to maximize time, an example might be, I showed you a little bit a few moments ago that uh, Big Blue Button was pulling out text in the slides and making a poll question. Well, imagine it just simply fed the text in the slide to, uh, an, uh, to an artificial general intelligence and said, give me a poll question on this so that the teacher wouldn't even have to create the poll question. It could just have one that prompted you to say, hey, I look like you're talking about the cornea of the eye and you've gone through a couple slides. Here's a, one or two questions that would let you quickly uh, do some formative assessment as to whether students have been following along. And the instructor doesn't have to create those but the, an AI could basically say, look, I know what the cornea of the eye is. Um, there's one thing about education, which actually really lends itself well to AI. And that a lot of stuff that we teach, the base stuff that we teach in class and courses is already known knowledge. Um, like I'm looking to my right at my calculus textbook from school and that hasn't changed in many, many years. So the, you know, I'm not, learning anything that hasn't already been taught in calculus and the teacher's not teaching anything that hasn't already been taught. The, the game is to try to figure out how to teach it more effectively, maximize time for applied learning and feedback and have the student to learn it more effectively. Um, Catherine, uh, AI tutor to students with disabilities? Absolutely. So when you look at ChatGPT right now, you're just seeing as chat, right? There's not far away from voice GPT or image GPT uh, or haptic feedback GPT. Like if I was disabled and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't see, I could, so I could start interacting with the tutor as a tireless assistant to me. Again, the thirst for knowledge. Um, I mean, man, Helen Keller, what a, what a, a what a gap chasm she had to cross to become, uh, proficient and, and a member of society. Um, ChatGPT, for anyone who has disabilities, could make it easier for them, could bridge the gap. Yeah, an assistant, exactly. Just tireless and, again, never, ever tell you the right answer. Don't rob the student of that joy of figuring it out. Of all the times I've thought over the years, like when I remember, like, where did I enjoy most programming, for example? It was when I took days to solve a hard problem and figured it out. Now, not suggesting that school should be so hard that you take days, but... Um, I think this joy of learning part is missing. Like going to school and to a classroom is not like watching a lecture passively and taking a picture of it. It's not like a Pokemon example where you collect all the balls and I'm collecting the pictures of the answers. It really is to, to feel the joy of actually struggling with something. It's just that a lot of times when we struggle, it just feels like we're hitting the wall and a tutor, if physical, or like a real tutor or a, an artificial general, intelligence, artificial general intelligence tutor would just help you along. So you still had to learn it yourself, but you got a little help along the way, a little feedback. Maka, yes, GPT-4. So it's you can just see the pieces wiring together, like uh, something that can mimic facial recognition or like human speaking like perfectly, of which they have. Um, something that can mimic the human voice, the intonations, the rise and fall, just like they have. 
Um, they have the, the chat, speech recognition, which they have, um, optical character recognition. So maybe I can look at what I'm writing at, which they have. So if you start to wind all these together, uh, you get to a place where you can talk to somebody. It looks like you're talking with somebody. I mean, what are we doing here? We're anthropomorphizing, right? We're imbuing human characteristics. But again, we learn from humans. Uh, it's going to be really cool to see. But what I'm watching is to see the tutoring part of it. It just seems so obvious that if you just mimic the capabilities of a tutor and give students visibility into learning pathways and then give the instructors visibility into what tutors or students are doing and along the pathways, um, the thought experiment I always use is like, imagine this existed today. And I was telling you that our world would be better if we took all this away. Take that personal tutor away from everybody. Take that information away from the instructor. Just more, make students learn from the textbook when they're, all, when they're not in class. That's just the old fashioned way. I don't think we get many takers on that. Um, as long as we don't short circuit the learning again, as long as the students have to figure it out themselves, all the tutor would do is just give them a bit of help along the way. All right, I'm gonna type my email in. Anybody has questions? I think Omar, the, the slides and that'll publish afterwards. Always welcome feedback. Uh, again, been working on this for 14 years now. We did Big Blue Button as an open source project. It's given us a lot of visibility in how other people around the world teach and learn online. And we believe that, uh, I mean, I personally believe that if we can build the world's most effective virtual classroom, it will have a societal impact around the world. Pretty good goal. And I believe that the era that we're entering into with AI has a lot of potential for good if we use it in the right way and think about it in the right way, which is also pretty exciting. So I'll hang here for a few more moments and then I'll wish you all the best of the, the rest of the sessions. Monica, good for getting Bloom's taxonomy first. Thomas, yes, for different learning styles. Do I learn visual? Do I learn audible? I mean, if the personal artificial intelligence tutor could do that, Paget. And for those of you that are interested in reading a little bit more about it, there. Kind of what I, it's a little bit of a, a deeper dive into brain theory and how AGI works, but um, this is how we're like thinking hard about how we can improve synchronous online. I will add one more to that. Some of the thinking, um, some of the thinking around what virtual classrooms could and should be, I um, actually thought about this as well. So there was an article that we wrote a while back on the future of virtual classrooms. And that's it right there. <laughs> you don't need the tracking ID. Um, basically, the future of virtual classrooms is not more webcams. If webcams was the answer, then every class taught during COVID would be awesome. It's, yeah, the answer is not more webcams. The answer is more applied learning and feedback. <laughs> 